Good morning, everyone. Oh my gosh, it's like we've got a party going on in here today. Yeah. <laughs> yes. A warm welcome to all who are on live stream. And I just am interested, those of you that are in the sanctuary today, how many is this your first time coming back since the pandemic? Oh, welcome back. This is so great to have you in person, in the flesh. And I want us to begin our worship service. This is a great uh, Sunday for us. We are baptizing Malcolm Vincent. And uh, yeah, we're excited about that. There's all kinds of great things we're going to do. But we are excited about the word that has become flesh. So let me begin with that scripture. And then we'll begin with worship singing, though you're actually invited to hum. I hate to say that to you, but we'll do the singing for you. Is that okay up front here? All right. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen His glory, the glory as of a Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. This is the one we worship this day. You're invited to stand and let us worship God. Oh 
invite Kirsten, Danny, Liz, and Malcolm to come on up onto the platform. And Pastor Mary can come up at this time too. <laughs> Hi, Malcolm. Good to see you. So for the past few weeks, I've had the chance to meet with Kirsten and Danny and Malcolm too, and we have talked about the meaning of the sacrament of baptism and how at the baptism, it is a sign and a seal of the symbol of God's enduring love for us, God's covenant love for us. When we pour water over children and adults, it is a sign that God's covenant love will be with us for all of time, that yes towards us. And we also say yes towards God in this covenant relationship as well through baptism. So during today's sacrament of baptism, it is a community event. Pastor Mary is going to say some questions to you and ask you about what you're going to commit to do as a part of this sacrament. And then I'll ask some questions of the family and we'll continue from there. So I'm going to pass it over to Pastor Mary now and she'll ask you some questions. Okay, these questions are for you. Do you, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture Malcolm by word and deed with love and prayer? If so, please say, we do. Do you and will you encourage him to know and follow Christ and to be a faithful member of his church, will you? Okay, and now we have some questions for Kirsten and Danny. Kirsten and Danny, do you desire that Malcolm be baptized? We do. We do. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? We do. Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to teach that faith to your children? We do. do. All right. Oh, I was going to skip ahead. Danny, it's your turn. So one of the things we do here at Trinity is that we like to ask families to take some of the general perspectives about what we just discussed in those questions and make them concrete and specific for each situation. So Danny and Kirsten have been praying a lot about what this means for them and they're gonna share that now with you all. Malcolm, this day you are experiencing the redeeming love of God, a love that you, the love that you receive from us and all your brothers and sisters in Christ will model God's unconditional love for us all. In birth, you entered our family and made it whole. In baptism, you enter the holy family of this church and all Christian people. We will model unwavering, okay, sometimes wavering trust in the Holy <laughs> Spirit and its guiding light in our lives. While this baptism comes at a time of intense change, both in our lives and in the world, we know that baptism is not just a welcoming into the church, but also a sending out. Change is scary, but we will be there together and trust that the Holy Spirit is leading us where our love and light is needed most. And indeed, Malcolm, we know you are a shining beacon of love to all who meet you. As parents, we know that there will be times that we fall short. And as our son, we know that you will have struggles too. But we know that as a family, our strength lies in not our own abilities, but in the grace of God. In this moment, we place your spirit in the hands of our Father, his son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, Malcolm, we're going to pray over the water first. Okay, Malcolm, let's, let's all pray together. We give you thanks, eternal God for you nourish and sustain all living things by the gift of water. In the beginning of time, your spirit moved over the watery chaos, calling forth order and life. In the time of Noah, you destroyed evil by the waters of the flood, giving righteousness a new beginning. You led Israel out of slavery through the waters of the sea into the freedom of the promised land. In the waters of Jordan, Jesus was baptized by John and anointed with your spirit. 
By the baptism of his own death and resurrection, Christ set us free from sin and death and opened the way to eternal life. We thank you, God, for the gift of the water of baptism. In it, we are buried with Christ in his death, and from it, we are raised to share in his resurrection. And through it, we are reborn by the power of the Holy Spirit. So God, send your spirit to move over this water, that it may be a fountain of deliverance and rebirth. Wash away the sin of all who are cleansed by it, and raise them to new life, and graft them to the body of Christ. Lord, may your spirit be upon Kirsten and Danny and list this day as they support and they sustain and they build up Malcolm in his Christian faith. And God, may your spirit be with Malcolm, especially today, but all days, God. Uphold him, care for him, protect him, guide him, bless him, Lord. We pray these prayers for Malcolm today. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon them that they may have the power to do your will and continue forever in the risen life of Christ. To you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, be all praise, honor, and glory now and forever. Amen. All right, Malcolm, do you want to come stand next to the font? You can, you can hold mom's hand, okay? You, re- you ready, Malcolm? All right. Malcolm Odom Vincent. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's welcome him into the life of Christ. (laughs) Malcolm, Malcolm, for you, Jesus Christ came into the world. For you, he lived and showed God's love. For you, he suffered darkness at Calvary and at the very last said, it is accomplished. For you, he overcame the power of death and he rose in newness of life. For you, he ascended and he reigns now at God's right hand. Malcolm, he did all of this for you, even though you don't quite know it all yet. And so today, the scripture is fulfilled that says we love because God loved us first. God loves you so much, Malcolm. You are now a member of Jesus Christ's church and family. You're getting a big hug from Liz. Now we're all going to give you a virtual hug with arms around him. So let's welcome him one more time into the life of the church. peace of Christ be with you. This is a peace we want to share and so you're invited to turn, not to necessarily move out of your pew, but turn to those who are near you and to pass the peace of Christ in whatever gestures you want to do that indicates you are spreading the love. Great to see you. Peace of Christ be with you. He likes it up here. (laughs) 
So if you look behind me, you can see all the books of the Bible that we have covered so far since last September. And we are moving our way through the biblical story, and it's been extremely rich to be in book by book. And this morning we are in the book of James. And when we think about who wrote James, there's actually four people in the New Testament named James. But the one they're most sure is the one who wrote this letter is the one who was the brother of Jesus and also a leader in the early church. Isn't that interesting to think about what it was like to grow up as Jesus' brother in his house? Let's listen to what James has to say in chapter 1, verses 19 to 27, and I'm going to pray as we prepare to be in God's Word. Let's pray. Lord, we want to hear you as powerfully as James did and even more so for our day and our time on this day, this morning. So by your Spirit, may these words come alive, be alive in us, and producing your fruit in the world. In Christ's name, amen. James 1, beginning of verse 19, listen to God's word to you. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, They are like those who look at themselves in a mirror, for they look at themselves, and on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious, and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, Their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. This is the gift of God's word. Thanks be to God. We're told in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus was teaching a crowd of people maybe a crowd like this, and somebody cried out in the middle of his teaching, was so overwhelmed with his teaching and impressed that this woman cried out and said, blessed is the woman who gave you birth and who nursed you. And you know how Jesus responded to that? He said, no, blessed is the one who hears the word of God and obeys it. And in Matthew, another story where Jesus is teaching, He's inside a house. He's told that his mother and his brothers are outside asking for him. And so he looks at the people in front of him and he said, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And then he points to them and he says, here's my mother, here's my brothers. Whoever hears the word of God, does the will of my Father in heaven, that's my mother, that's my brothers. Now think about that story, because I'm pretty sure James was outside at that moment, right? The brother of Jesus. And so he must have heard about that whole conversation. And he must have been thinking, what did he say? He said that those guys were his brothers? Wait a minute. And what James heard, I'm sure, because it got saved and put into Scripture, was the point that Jesus was making that hearing and doing, the hearing of God's word, the doing of God's word, go together. You cannot separate them, and there's many times that you hear Jesus making that point, teaching and then saying, blessed are you if you do them. People will know you by your fruits, hearing God's word and then doing God's word. So this must have been a challenge because James is making the same point here, realizing that it is a problem for the people he's writing to, and he's a leader in the church. 
Hearing and doing, hearing God's word, doing God's word, go together. And you can tell from what I just read that they, are have, a, they have a problem with this. And he uses the word deceived two times, which means they don't know they're having a problem with this hearing and doing. So I want us to look at both sides of that, the hearing and the doing, and what James has to say about that. Well, he's quick, first of all, to talk about the importance of the hearing. Be quick to listen, he writes. Slow to speak. Slow to be angry. And you can tell that their listening isn't producing God's righteousness. And so he says this statement, and it's an invitation, and in some ways it's a command, because it's an imperative. Let the word of God be implanted in you. The word of God that has the power to save your souls. Actually, he says it like this. Welcome with meekness the implanted word of God, which has the power to save your souls. What's it mean to be a good hearer of God's word? We hear this illustration and the metaphor of it being planted in us. I want to remember with you a parable that Jesus told, the parable of the sower. It's also been called the parable of the four soils. What is Jesus talking about in this parable? The planting of God's word, how it actually is successfully planted or is not successfully planted. How many of you have heard this parable before? You know the four soils, so let's remember them together. Jesus is talking about a farmer. A farmer is throwing out seed, sowing seed. It's landing all over the place. That seed is the word of God. And some of that seed lands on a path. And it's a hardened path. And so the seed does not sink down roots at all. Pretty soon, a bird comes and picks up that seed and carries it away. And Jesus says that path, that soil, is like someone who hears the word of God but doesn't understand it, and so Satan comes and just plucks it away. So that's the hardened soil. Some seed, he said, falls on rocky ground. And so there's some soil, but it's really shallow soil. The seed puts down roots, but as soon as the sun comes up and blazes on that seed, because it doesn't have much depth, it withers away and it dies. Jesus says that soil... It's like people who hear the Word of God, they're excited about it. They receive the Word of God with joy. But because they have no depth, whenever trouble comes or persecution comes because of that seed, because of the Word of God, they fall away and the seed dies. Some seed falls on soil where there are thorns. And it takes root and grows up But the thorns grow up too, right? And the the weeds, and they choke the seed. Jesus says that soil is like those who hear the word of God and it takes root and they grow and then the weeds and the thorns grow too and it's like the cares of the world, the lure of wealth, they choke out that seed, that word of God. This is the one I can relate to the most just being surrounded by all the distractions, all the competing things, even when I am in the Word, I'm thinking about something else. There's so many things on my mind, so many things to compete with the Word, and it gets choked out. Fourth soil, some seed falls on good soil. It's good soil because the seed puts down roots and it grows into a full plant and it produces, it produces 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. Those four soils illustrating the implanted word of God in us. But only one out of four actually turns a hearer into a doer. And I want us to notice as well that of all four of them, three of those soils take no work at all, right? They're just what happens naturally. A hardened path, rocky soil, thorns in our lives, but good soil, that takes work, right? Having good soil, 
I have a friend, uh, she and her husband have a garden in their backyard, and she was telling me this past week that she did a lot of work in planting their garden, and she was pretty proud of that because it does take a lot of work. And because of this sermon, I said, well, tell me what you had to do to create good soil for these plants. So she did. She went through all of it. She had to have aerated soil. I know nothing about these things. I am not a gardener. So I'm just taking her word for it. So I hope you all who are gardeners agree. But aerated soil, that's an ingredient that was really important. She said fertilizer. You've got to have nutrients in that soil. You also need to choose where you're planting because there needs to be good sunlight on that garden. And you need to have good seeds. You can't use last year's seeds. You need to follow the instructions. She laughed at that one, because I think her husband doesn't usually follow the instructions. You need to follow the instructions. You need to prune it a little bit. And what am I leaving out? Water. You need to water it, and you need to water it regularly, and you need to water it so that it gets enough water, but not too much water. It takes intentionality to have good soil. It doesn't just happen. So as James is giving us this invitation and command, welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. We have to be intentional to be that kind of hearer, to have that implanted word in us. So we've been in scripture all year long because we know how important it is in terms of hearing the word of God. But what are the ingredients, my friends? that will help that implanted, be implanted, that word of God? What will help us hear God speaking to us to be hearers of the word? I can think of a few ingredients that are absolutely essential. If you look around the sanctuary, you are looking at one of them, which is the community. To be in hearing God's word with other people. It's the way all these books were intended to be read. They were written to a community. They were read to a community. They were understood in community. And it's still today to understand the word, to really hear it, to have it go deep in us. We need the gift of one another, the gift of teachers, the gift of hearing what it sounds like in somebody else's life. That is an absolute essential for the good soil to have us really hear God's word. What else is needed? to have good soil, to welcome with meekness the implanted word. There needs to be regularity, right? There needs to be, you said watering, but we need to be in this word enough that it actually nurtures that seed and lets the roots go down deep and also produces fruit. It is wonderful that you are here. It's wonderful you're on the live stream and you're listening to God's word in worship. It has to be more than that, right? It also has to be in your life, regularly in your life. And I think James knew, as Jesus knew, that this is not easy. It's kind of easy to deceive ourselves, that we are welcoming that implanted word when actually we are probably three out of those four soils a lot of the time. Boom. <laughs> we don't really understand and we don't have that soil that will help us understand. We don't have the depth. We have a wonderful experience of hearing God's word, perhaps even at a camp or at a Sunday morning sermon, and then that was what, 10 years ago, 20, 30 years ago? Or the thorns, the things that compete and make it so hard to spend any time in God's word with other people. Welcome with meekness the implanted word that is able, it has the power to save your souls, James writes. And I like the way Eugene Peterson puts it. He says this, In simple humility, let our gardener, God, landscape you with the word, making a salvation garden of your life. Isn't that lovely? So that's the hearing. And then there was the doing. That also you can tell in this passage is problematic and that they are deceiving themselves. So what's happening here, and what indication do we have that they're deceiving themselves? He says, you are like people who go and look in the mirror, and he's really describing they are in Scripture. You almost get the sense they're in worship. They have a sense of who they are as God's people, God's chosen, God's blessed ones. 
And yet they go away from that mirror and they forget that that blessing and called and chosen to be a blessed people in the world also means being a blessing to other people. So you get to the end and he's, he can tell that they think of themselves as religious, right? You know, you, you think you're religious, but pure religion is this, that you care for the orphans and the widows. In that day, the people who were the least cared for, the least noticed, the most vulnerable were orphans and widows. James starts out this passage calling them beloved, my beloved. Nobody was calling orphans my beloved. Nobody was calling the widows my beloved. Nobody was caring for their needs or advocates for them. So no matter how bad we might think our lives are, there's always people that are worse off, that are needing the blessings that we have. And how easy it is and how tempting it is to receive the blessings that God gives, the belovedness, all the things that we just say, thank you, God, that I have this. But that it stops there, which is not what God's word is about. That fruitful garden takes those blessings and moves them out to others. During the pandemic, I got to know one of my neighbors uh, who walks her dog a lot. She's extremely friendly and uh, it strikes up a conversation easily. So I like to walk a lot. So I was out there and we'd bump into each other and start talking. Eventually, she found out I was a pastor. So she was eager to tell me, and she's actually been eager to tell me this every time she sees me now, that she, write, or she likes to watch Joel Osteen on television. And that really feeds her spirit and encourages her and uplifts her and her faith. And she is really counting her blessings. And she just went on and she just said, I, I've worked hard, I've made enough money, she's now in retirement, I uh, waited long enough with Social Security, I maxed out my Social Security, so I just have so much and I'm healthy and I can do what I want, and I thank God every day for my blessings, which I think is great, and could affirm with her just that spirit of gratitude in her. And then as she's done that litany with me probably three or four times since I've seen her and known about, or she knew about me being a pastor, I've noticed, and maybe it's because I'm on the brink of retirement myself, and I have a lot of people really feeding to me, I think what, what is the common understanding of what retirement is supposed to be. You've worked hard, it's time for you to relax, to enjoy life, do all the things you love to do, uh, you deserve it, and really to have those blessings kind of go and just stop right there. And it's a temptation. Now, I don't know if she's doing service kinds of things. Those aren't the things she's sharing with me or if those blessings are going out to others. I don't know that part of her life. But I just want to say to you in this church that I am seeing models for the holding together, the hearing of God's word and the doing on Friday afternoon in our small group, we said, who comes to mind? We asked, who comes to mind when you think of people who are holding together the hearing of God's word and the doing? And it was so delightful to hear the names flow out. Names of people here right now. Mike and Sherry Garut, Scott McMullen, just on and on it went. Um, Kathy and Rod Lair, people who are taking the blessings that God has given to them Whatever it is, time, resources, health, expertise, and it's not just staying there because that's not what the Word of God does in our lives. It moves us out to people who are hungry for God's blessing, to know their belovedness, who do not have their needs met. I think it's easy for us to think, well, great, Mary, people who are retired have time for that. <laughs> They have resources for that. They have the freedom to do those kinds of things. That's not my life. And for many, life is so burdensome right now. They are the ones that need the care. They are the ones that need people to come and bless them. And what does this word have to say to all of us on the spectrum? 
Well, I want to tell you about Irene Pack Lee. She is a pastor in San Jose, associate pastor, and she has two little kids, uh, one and three or four. She posts on Facebook often, and she's posted pictures of her kids, videos of her kids. They are darling. And about six months ago, she wrote this Facebook post that was very poignant. She said, this year has been so difficult. I can barely even tell you how hard it's been on me, our family. They both got COVID. She had to figure out how to be a pastor, do youth ministry with the pandemic, with two little kids at home. She said, I came to the breaking point many, many times. And what blessed me was my family. She said, I know it's been very hard and harder for many of you. You have not been able to be with your family. You've not been able to see your family or see your grandkids. And so I have posted pictures of my kids and videos of my kids and the blessing they are to me, hoping that it will bless you. And I looked at that and I thought, you know, it has. I have been blessed looking at the pictures and the videos of her kids. She didn't have anything. She didn't have any time. She had no resources, nothing left to give. But she was blessed, and the Word of God in her made of her a salvation garden where she wanted to share that blessing. That's what the Word of God does in us. I think this challenge, being hearers of God's Word and doers of God's Word, will always be a challenge for us. I think that's why it came up for Jesus so often. It's why it has come up a couple times in the book of James. That we, even this morning, perhaps can see, oh my gosh, I really thought that I was having the, the word implanted in me and being that good soil. Maybe I have not been. Maybe I have been deceived. And that maybe I have just let the blessings just stop with me and I've just said, thank you God for my blessings and that's been good enough. And it really hasn't gone out. Friends, I think we are always self-deceiving on one end of that in some way or another. Kirsten, how great it was, you and Danny, your honesty and your commitment. <laughs> Never wavering. Okay, maybe sometimes wavering. <laughs> and here we are in our journey. But we need the mirror of being with one another and being in God's word in Jesus Christ and realize, wait, this is what good soil is. This is what God wants for us, that word of God planted in us so that it's growing up and it's bearing fruit and it's blessing and it's moving us out to those who have less than we have that do not know their belovedness, do not have enough in the world. And the statement, the invitation, welcome with meekness, the implanted word has this next phrase, which has the power to save. Jesus Christ has the power to bring us back, to lead us to that place of meekness and receiving and once again reaching out to be that good soil. Letting the body of Christ help you with this. If you feel stuck, it's like, I've tried. I've tried this to be in scripture. I've tried a small group. I hated it. I've tried this. If you're stuck, Phil and Holly, raise your hands. Talk to them, spiritual formation leaders. They would love to talk with you about how to work with your context, which is what Jesus does, meets us where we are and gives us a new day, every day new, every day fresh, every day leading us to that place where we can let our gardener, God, landscape us with the word, making us a salvation garden for others. Let's pray. Oh Lord, open our eyes as we sang earlier to see how perhaps we have deceived ourselves. Maybe relying on old experiences with you and your word. Maybe your word is being choked out by all the other competing concerns in our lives. Maybe we are not intentionally and meekly creating the kind of soil that will allow you to be planted in us and bear much fruit. Deliver us from discouragement and hear us even now to hear your invitation and your promise and your power to save. 
For we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. few announcements for us now today. The first is that we'll be having a congregational meeting today after church, and because we just moved to yellow, our plans for this were to be all online on Zoom. So if you're at home, you can grab that Zoom link off the email blast and join us at 11 a.m. But if you're here in the sanctuary today, you can stay inside the sanctuary, actually. That's just fine. We're going to project it on the screens with the audio and then I will give you a Wi-Fi password at the end of our worship service, but I won't say it now so that all the people on the internet will know what the Wi-Fi password is. So you can stay in here, but it may be difficult for you to interact. You can write chat if you have a question. During the congregational meeting, it's going to be uh, just one motion. It's going to be quick to dissolve your relationship with me. And then after that, there's going to be a town hall where elders will be there to present all the information on what's happening with the transition. And then there'll be a lot, a lot of time for you to ask questions too during that meeting today. So uh, stick around for that today. And then next week is Pentecost. And after worship next week, we're going to have an extended time of fellowship outside on the patio. We're going to have donuts too. Hopefully lots of colorful donuts with lots of sprinkles. Those are my favorites. And have a nice time of fellowship outside on the patio next week. So everyone's invited to come to that. And... And am I missing anything? No, I don't think so. Oh, and as always, we invite you to give and to be part of the doers of ours, just giving into the life of this church. So I invite you to do that now by way of going to trinity-prez.org slash give. And you can also, yes, that's the way we invite you to do it digitally now. So thank you, friends. You may rise in body or spirit as we continue to worship God this morning. Let's continue to worship. join me in the prayers of the people. Let's, let's pray together. God, as we gather for worship right now and as we pray, my heart is still on the memories of baptizing Malcolm. And truly the blessing and the gift that it is, God, that your love, your grace, your mercy extends to us before we even have a chance to respond to it. 
Before we were even alive, God, you were at work reconciling humanity to yourself. You sent Jesus into the world to rescue us, to take care of us, to lift us out of death, out of bondage, and to bring us into holy relationship with you, God. I'm, for that, I'm so thankful, Lord. And I think there's so much grace in life with you so that when it comes time to, to really consider what kind of soil our lives will be, you have been there all along gardening, preparing our hearts, preparing our lives, bringing relationships into our lives and into our midst to help us grow up in our faith. So Lord, we are thankful for who you are, the way you till our bodies, till our families, and grow in us the word of God. How that grace and that mercy that's been extended to us ought naturally to extend to others. So Lord, we give you thanks for you. And as we worship and as we pray, we think of so many friends, brothers, and sisters in Christ who need your love today. We lift up to you families in our midst, as Pastor Mary mentioned in her sermon, who've had a difficult year this last year, for parents who have struggled to find a way in the midst of the pandemic to care for their little ones, for little ones and children and teenagers who were used to a way of life and then it was so utterly disrupted over the last year having to be home instead of being at school and seeing friends and doing those types of things. And Lord, as we see a great transitioning happening right now and all sorts of things feeling like it's coming back into some sense of normal, we're thankful for that God. We're thankful for doctors, for nurses, for scientists who have worked so hard over the past year and a half to get us to this point, God. Thank you for them. Thank you for their just their faithfulness to their work, to their dedication to humans and caring for people all around this earth. I think when we see their hard work, we see the kind of doing that you're talking about, God, hearing about God's love and doing God's love in our work, in our vocations. So Lord, we're thankful for all the people that have played a role in helping us get to where we are today. Lord, we give you thanks for you. And we give you thanks, God, that we are not just to hear the word, but we are to do it. We are to receive that love and that gift that you give to us, that covenant love that is sealed into us in our baptism. But then, Lord, we are to do that love in this world as well. We are to share that love. We are to lift up those who are hurting, who are broken, the orphans, the widows, the poor people in our midst those who are on the bottom side of society who have been marginalized, you have asked us to reach out and to bring them into wholeness of life with you and love God. So Lord, help us do that. Help us open our lives to the work that you would have yourself do in our lives. Be that gardener, till in us every good gift that you have given to us. And may it be of service to you and in glory to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ today. Amen.
In simple humility, let our gardener, God, landscape you in the Word, making a salvation garden in your life. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated.